You know, I had a difficult time coming up with enough movies to fill my top 10 movies of 2022 so far. But with streaming, you guessed it, I had too many movies for a top 10 list. In fact, I came up with 20 shows that I would highly recommend. And again, we're only halfway through the year. So 10 shows couldn't make the cut, but I wanted to show them here because I really do think they're worth your time. Please, if you need something to watch, here you go. Uh, also, I want you to note, because you might be like, what about uh, Ms. Ms. Marvel or Only Murders in the Building Season 2? Well, you had to have your show finished by July 1st to qualify for this list. So let's see how those seasons end, and maybe they'll make my uh, top 10 for the year. I don't know, though. The competition, as you're going to see, is pretty tough. Because these are the shows that didn't make my top my top ten, and you can see they're all there's there's some really good streaming here. That's why streaming is so hot right now, and why the movie business is so very very afraid. Because you've got a lot of good reasons to not go to the movies. Uh, so these are, these are the shows that almost almost made my top ten of 2022 so far. And let's now go over the ones that did. With no spoilers, in case you didn't watch any of these shows, some of them I bet you didn't, and then you'll be able to go back and check them out without having them spoiled. All right, so and this, this is the longest video because I don't do a lot of streaming reviews all the time uh, because like the audience is more spread out, but I really want to talk about some of these shows. All right, so number 10, Moon Knight. To be honest with you, I don't think this is quite as good as some of the ones that didn't make the top 10, but I really wanted to put a Marvel show on this list because I think they're so they're such a dominant force in streaming with the Disney Plus work that they do. And while I thought the middle of Moon Knight was not good, episode one and episode five and six were so good with a really strong end credit scene that I do feel good about this show. And I think it really made its mark. Uh, I think not just by adapting a comic book that's very difficult to adapt to a new medium, but with a standout performance by Oscar Isaac. His own special effect what, that he made Mark Spector and Stephen Grant seem like truly separate individuals. As I said, no spoilers. And he was able to act opposite himself was not just fascinating to watch, but very entertaining. The show also gets you to really think about dissociative identity disorder, which I think is a big win and makes the show very unique and special. Overall, I feel really good about Moon Knight, even though I think it could have been much better and had problems as a show. That's why it's number 10. Number nine, Barry season three. You know, when Barry season three first started, I didn't think it would make my top 10, but thanks to a mind blowing second half of the season, maybe even just the last third, not only does it make my top 10, but I think Barry season three will once again be a major awards contender and potentially winner. This is good stuff. This show, even in its third season, still has the ability to really surprise us. This is really funny, very clever. This writer's room is gifted. And it continues to be a fantastic commentary on the absurdity and cruelty of show business. Also, we already knew that Bill Hader was a talented comedian and actor, as so many comedians are. Comedians are typically very good at drama. But he's really blossomed into an amazing director, uh, directing the best episodes this season. And when they just recently announced season four, they also announced that Hater will be directing all of those episodes. Wow, I'd love for him to do a movie next. Uh, but this isn't just the Bill Hader show. He has a really strong supporting cast, especially Henry Winkler, Anthony Kerrigan, and I think Sarah Goldberg deserves a shout out too. Her role isn't as flashy as the other two, as uh, Winkler and Kerrigan, but she's certainly no less interesting, especially this season. She had some great scenes this season. Great character arc. Number eight, we crashed. Now, I know a lot of people don't care for Jared Leto these days, or Anne Hathaway, but I think they both do some of their best work here. If you can separate the person from the work, I think you'd, you would equally be blown away by this show. We Crashed was part of a trend of shows this year, highlighting how charismatic individuals are able to blindside and manipulate the ultra wealthy. From inventing Anna to the dropout to We Crashed. Those other two shows almost made my top 10. They're all excellent, but We Crashed made the top 10. Uh, but all three of those, by the way, show the huge flaws in how businesses are created and grown these days. But the reason We Crash made my top 10 and the other two didn't is that I think this show in particular excels at highlighting how business works today. Both the flaws, 
but also some of why it still works and why it's so hard for investors to sort out the frauds from the unicorns. Unicorn is an actual business term, and you would know that if you watched We Crashed, which is not only entertaining, but an excellent crash course in 21st century business. It's like going to business school. It's great. It's really interesting. I learned a lot watching this show. Adam Newman might have had a spectacular fall from grace that was totally his own fault, but that doesn't mean he still didn't have some really good ideas and was a very good salesman. Uh, it just, he wasn't selling something that was good. All right, number seven, Heartstopper. Not only is this a charming show, but it's a very important show. As certain groups look to paint the LGBT community as malicious predators, the wholesome Heartstopper shows that LGBT teens are just like everyone else, or at least would like to be if it wasn't for the hate and misunderstanding in society. And Heartstopper doesn't ignore the harsh realities of today, but it doesn't let it define those realities define the show either. Uh, and while I Love Victor became all about uh, the entire cast hooking up in its third season, I thought Love Victor became very titillating and salacious. What I liked about, what I appreciate about Heartstopper is that it's still a show with a story. And while it's about relationships, it's not just, it's about romance, it's about romantic relationships. I thought Love Victor lost a lot of the romance. It was more about raging hormones over there. But Heartstopper is about romantic relationships, platonic relationships, and also your relationship with yourself, how you see yourself, which I thought was really important. Uh, it's both simple and sophisticated and the best mainstream representation yet of the LGBT community with all the letters represented and showing the racial divers diversity of the community as well. I watched uh, Heartstopper straight. It's uh, three episodes. I mean, 30, 30, 30 minute episodes. I watched it straight through and I just thought it was fantastic. Number six, uh, Ozark season four. It might have had a controversial ending or not really even an ending at all. I predict it at Ozark's season five return someday. Uh, but Ozark definitely captured audiences' attention with its final extended season. Right now, everyone's talking about Stranger Things, but Ozark generated quite a bit of attention with both drops. Uh, it was, its season was split just like Stranger Things 4, and attention is something Netflix desperately needs right now. So it's good that it has more than one show that can do that. Anti-hero Jason Bateman was an instant hit with fans, so good in the role. But Julia Garner's Spunky Ruth was a wonderful surprise, with Garner's career definitely launched by the show. And she went on to inventing Anna, and it looks like she's going to be Madonna. And Laura Linney, wow, lover or hater, one of the greatest, most complex TV villains of all time, and one of the rare female ones. Such a great role. If The Sopranos was about the mob mob, well, Ozark was about America's corporate mob and how the line between illegal and legal is actually not so well defined, especially for the white collar community. That was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Number five, Julia, not Julia Garner, but Julia Child. I loved this show. My new comfort food show, fittingly. Uh, after Mrs. Maisel, this like replaced Mrs. Maisel for me, which had its own season four this year, and that almost made this list, but I really think Julia is fantastic. I think Mrs. Maisel messed up a little bit this season. It wasn't at the level of its past season, so that's why Julia is on this list and Mrs. Maisel season four is not. But I do love escaping to the 1960s, uh, seeing it through the eyes of today, but also seeing how actions taken back then have had strong repercussions that we still are feeling today. And also, Lost. Julia, the show Julia, highlights the importance of public television, which has largely faded away. Sarah Lancashire's Julia Child might be a bit broad, a bit overly comedic, but there's also so much heart to the performance, so much cleverness and nuance, it is a wonderful and inspiring character. It's also great to see Frasier stars David Hyde Pierce and B.B. Newworth back on TV, while newcomers Fran, uh, Fran Kranz and Brittany Bradford hold their own. And this show isn't just for women, it's for anyone who, who's felt like an outsider, but also felt at the same time like they had something to offer others. It's just a great show. I absolutely adore it. So good. It's coming back for a second season. I'm, I'm so ecstatic. Number four, I don't know if this is going to have a second season because it can't really, but number four is The Offer, and I love this show even more. Wow. Wow. It's got the coziness of Mrs. Maisel and Julia, but also the magic of Hollywood. 
Being on the studio lot, and Paramount is one of the most famous studio lots, is a very special quality about Hollywood. And this is a movie which totally captures that. Plus, a rare look at what producers and studio executives do rather than directors and actors. There is some very interesting commentary about directors and actors as well, but the focus is on the suits, and that is great. What a refreshing change of pace. And what a story! The making of The Godfather is as fascinating as the movie itself. And, both, and the Godfather trilogy, by the way, is also available on Paramount+. Plus. The, mo the show got me to watch the movie again. Uh, and this is also a great showcase for the unique business that is show business. The cast is pitch perfect across the board, with Miles Teller as a great anchor in the lead. Thank goodness Army Hammer dropped out. Uh, not just because of his scandal, but I don't think he would have nearly been as good. Juno Temple has a fantastic role here, showing the transition period in Hollywood where women went from underappreciated secretaries who were doing much more than just being secretaries to being power players themselves. The fact that she, her character, a real woman, I don't want to spoil what happens to her character, but the fact that she doesn't get a credit, a producer credit on The Godfather is ridiculous. But my favorite characters by far are Bern Gorman as Charlie, the Austrian head of Gulf and Western and owner of Paramount, and Matthew Good as the iconic Robert Evans. Good is so good here that it would be criminal, it would be criminal if he doesn't get nominated for best supporting for his work on the offer. Gorman and Good, both from the UK actually, playing an Austrian and American, they deliver the kind of megawatt absurd personalities that has made Hollywood so iconic. Oh, I love them! Number three, Winning Time. I, sense, I, I think you're seeing a theme here. A lot of these shows are about show business. And this is about the business of sports entertainment, which is just as fascinating. I didn't even know this was a thing, and I am captivated. Uh, but sports wasn't a business until Jerry Buss came along, and with this show, you will see many of the staples of modern sports being born, being dreamed up, and that also is just so cool to see. Uh, I don't, again, I don't want to spoil anything. I want you to discover it when you watch the show. Also, the stylistic approach of the show with that 70s feel, but modern camera work and editing, including amazing basketball action sequences, is just a thrilling combination. Uh, this is the role that John C. Riley was born to play. He is Jerry Buss. While Jason Clark, Adrian Brody, and Gabby Hoffman are also standouts. Plus, new everybody's good on this show, though. But newcomers Quincy Isaiah and Solomon Hughes, real-life basketball player turned actor, shine as one of the most iconic duos in sports history, Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, this is the over-the-top, historically accurate truth-telling that only Adam McKay, a producer here, can deliver. All right, final two. Number two, I can't believe it's the runner-up, and I bet you can't either, Stranger Things 4. This show, though, is so good. We thought it was good before, but Stranger Things Season 4 has the Duffer Brothers finally leveling up to be as good as the 1980s classic movies they're paying homage to throughout the entire course of this uh, series. And with the brilliant idea of supersized episodes, nine episodes turns into six movies. Oh, that is such a great gift. Six incredible movie nights. Plus, as the show gets ready to wrap up with just one more season to go, the fifth final season, we're finally seeing some shocking consequences. As I said, no spoilers. But are you not watching Stranger Things? <laughs> Plus, the show is also still capable, while it does justice to its OG characters, it's also able to introduce great new characters like Jamie Campbell Bower, Joseph Quinn, and Eduardo Franco. And at a time when audiences are upset with Hollywood lecturing them, Stranger Things 4 still manages to organically elevate its female character so well this season. This is actually a very uh, female-centric season, and almost no one has noticed it because they did it so subtly. But they create some of the best female action final girls since Ripley in the Alien franchise, herself a take on the final girl trope. And then the number one show, as I'm sure many of you have guessed, is Severance. Better than Stranger Things 4? If you're saying that right now, you didn't watch Severance, because it is that good. And it's a shame! You need to check it out right now. Severance is one of the biggest surprises ever in the streaming television space. Coming out of nowhere, Apple TV? Ben Stiller, director-producer? Ben Stiller did this? Yes, he did. 
Uh, and yet here we are with Stiller emerging as a tour de force behind the scenes with a show that certainly has its funny moments, but is also a nail-biting sci-fi thriller. Oh my gosh, what started out as a Twilight Zone type story evolves into movie level entertainment with one of the most tense, inventive season fina finales ever made. Everyone who watched it was shouting at their TV. I was literally shouting at my TV, jumping up and down on my sofa, literally on the edge of my seat. It was incredible. Don't let anyone ruin it for you. Watch it right now. Season two is going to be big, so you better get on board now. You don't want to be playing catch up when it's too late. And those are my top 10 streaming shows of 2022 so far. I can't imagine a show that could unseat anything in the top five, but we'll see. Uh, maybe She-Hulk. There's some good stuff coming up. And Andor, yeah, there's good stuff coming up. But wow, this is really good. Share your own thoughts down, your own thoughts and lists down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.